Well, good afternoon, and uh, congratulations on surviving the last session of the day. Um, my name is Chuck Hickson, and I'm with Kevin Gilson once again uh, to talk about uh, 3D GIS and integrating data. And, and before we do that, I kind of want to ask a couple quick questions, and uh, the first is the obvious. How many folks here, if you show a raise of hands, uh, were at our presentation yesterday? All right, so almost all of you. So, excellent. You can go now. <laughs> no, no, we will expand on that. Um, of, while we're still doing a little interactive, how many people here are doing things with GIS or 3D GIS or integrating? So we got one to a bunch of you. If you don't mind me asking real quick, what are we doing? If I, I'll start with you. You're my first victim. Me? Yeah, you. <laughs> Okay. How about way in the back? Who raised their hand? Who? So who's... We do parking demand and supply analysis. Okay, parking demand. Very good. And over here, did somebody raise their hand? No? All right, very good. Well, it's always good to know your audience. Um, let's just get right to it then. So, uh, again, just kind of a learning objective of what we'd like to achieve today is uh, the trend out there within the industry is the GIS community is migrating to the world of 3D and also trying to integrate their data with other data sets. Um, hopefully today we'll give you an idea, a better idea of what's involved with it, uh, warts and all. Today not everything is fantastic as you'll find out, um, especially uh, there's a lot of uh, daunting challenges. And then uh, basically hopefully give you an idea of whether you would want to head in this direction in the near future. So I'm just going to skip right over that. And um, I think this slide is pretty, pretty uh, relevant to today. And um, why do we need to visualize? Well, this man knew it best. If I can visualize it, I can understand it. Your primary sense is sight. And you certainly adapt a lot quicker when you can see things. So I'm going to help you visualize. And, and it, this probably explains why the GIS community started over 20 years ago. Because um, numbers sometimes really don't mean anything to us. And uh, I'll pick on the uh, debt ceiling that we just raised, which was at $16.3 trillion. And to me, does anyone in here really comprehend how much $16.3 trillion? It's a lot, but I'm going to help you visualize so you can understand it better. And I'm going to actually award one lucky participant this fine American dollar bill, if you can correctly guess. So this dollar bill is six inches in length, approximately. So if I took $16.3 trillion, one dollar bills, put them end to end, I'd like somebody to guess how many times you think they'd go around the earth. And if you're correct, I will give you this $1 bill. So anybody want to take a guess? Nobody? Come on, it's a dollar. Somebody. So what we got over here? Anybody? 40. 40. Okay, 40. Do I have any more or less? More? How many more. <laughs> more. How many more? A thousand. A thousand. Daring. Okay, anybody else? How much? 100,000? Holy cow, okay. Anybody want to top that? 100,000. Well, the correct answer, who said $100,000? Or 100,000 times? That is the correct answer. So this dollar bill is yours. Well, it's really not 100,000. I lied. It's 163,000 times that it'll go around the earth. So let's visualize that even more. If I took 100 one dollar bills and I stacked them one on top of the other it'd be approximately an inch in height so if I took 16.3 trillion one dollar bills wrapped them around the earth 163,000 times the height would be 133 feet or the height of the deck on the Brooklyn Bridge so that's how much 16.3 trillion really is it's a lot and I don't know if we're ever going to pay that debt off, but 
again, if I can visualize it, I can understand it, and that is really the premise behind um, what 3D GIS is trying to do, is take all those numbers, all that information, and put it in terms that we can all understand. One thing Kevin and I stressed yesterday is we're not promoting a process, a piece of software. We're trying to give you an idea of there's many tools out there to achieve um, your goals. And uh, as we demonstrate, you'll see that I use certain software applications and Kevin uses different ones. Both work. It's that the general premise is to use what you have and, and use it in a different way. Um, and also, we work on projects that are big and small. Some are, a, uh, let's say, a, a, we do a lot of work for TD Bank, so I'm doing parking lots for TD Banks, but using the technology. Kevin might be doing the Bay Bridge and using it for a project of that size. So it, it works across the board for any type of project. Again, a process, not, a, not, not any kind of particular um, software happens. I'm going to go quickly through these because we covered most of them yesterday. Some brief benefits, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, the primary one is today there are a lot of excellent sources of data out there. Um, the primary problem we see is the data is disjointed. It's not easy to get to that information um, or it's not easy to share that information. Um, all of those things uh, certainly create inefficiencies, misunderstandings, um, and general slowdowns, and this technology is one reason why we're trying to implement it. Um, again, a much better way to manage assets. Uh, we showed some demos yesterday when I could see the space or empty space in a building in a third dimension, it makes it a lot easier for me to understand um, the impacts of that empty space. Uh, we're in a virtual world today, a, a gaming world, so we need to move in real time and see that information uh, as well. And just as important, we need to convey that information in multiple sources, uh, whether it's a mobile device or over the internet or still using, you know, a notebook like I'm using here. Again, other benefits. Uh, Improving operations and management is a, certainly a big one. Uh, again, I'm exploiting information that I have uh, with other data sets so I can make better decisions. Um, all of these things we covered in heavy detail, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time today on them. And, and of course, public involvement is, is a real big one. If, if I'm going to plan, design, um, and construct using this technology. It's certainly one of the many byproducts is to be able to convey that information, whether it's to a stakeholder or the public or, or even going over the design with the design team. So lots of great reasons why we should mi migrate to it. Today I'd like to focus more on the challenges of implementing all of this. Again, using 3D tools to build and then using a database structure to see all that information. Um, one of the big ones right up front is a cultural or generational change. Uh, uh, back in the early 80s, I was the guy bringing in CAD workstations and taking out drafting boards. That was certainly a generational time. There are draftsmen who have been drafting for 40 plus years. Getting them to use a CAD machine was daunting to say the least. And we're really at that same juncture today where we're trying to get people not only to think in the third dimension, but also link that information um, in some sort of data format. Uh, a good example of that will be Revit. Uh, you, Revit is a three-dimensional modeling tool. And if somebody's been modeling or doing CAD in just 2D, that's certainly uh, a lot of effort to think in the Z. But then we combine that by attaching data to that Revit model. It's yet another challenge that that person needs to face. So, so a lot happening rapidly. And certainly generational, the younger folks in my firm pick up everything a lot faster than us gray hair folks. Um, another one is <laughs> technology seems to be updating on a daily basis. Uh, we're hearing constantly about new things that are coming out. And uh, yesterday I showed this graphic, which 
is still worth showing again today is where do you fit on the technology curve? Are you a innovator, or early adopter, or are you a laggard? And both ends are, are good places to be depending on what you want to achieve, but you need to get on this technology curve or you're going to get run over, so you need to decide when to jump in. And that, that is very much a struggle. If I go back to Revit as a, a, a good example, um, one of the challenges of Revit is it's expensive. And if you're a small firm and you have seven licenses of AutoCAD and now you need to upgrade that to seven licenses of Revit, that's a huge expense and burden that you need to take on, not only to buy the software, but then to train people to use that software. And, oh yeah, it's going to probably take longer the first time you use Revit, so your production time is going to be even longer. So some serious considerations need to be taken as you adopt new technology, no, no matter what it is. I hear this one a lot as well. Uh, what do I do with all that data? How do I manage it? Uh, anything from if you've ever uh, been involved in laser scanning, there's some huge massive files that you need to deal with. How do you store that information? Or more importantly, what do you do with that laser scan building a roadway once you have it? How do you use that information? Um, those are all challenges you need to face um, as well. Budgeting's a big one. How do I budget for something I really don't understand? And to me, that's a real big hurdle that most uh, transportation agencies are facing. How do I make an investment in something I, I don't understand? Or I really don't understand the return on investment for going this route yet. So it's certainly causing a, a lot of angst. Um, a, an example could be Again, I'll pick on Revit for a minute. Revit takes an advanced workstation to run properly. Um, have you budgeted properly to get that extra horsepower to run Revit? Um, or I want to do a project using 3D GIS applications. How do I even start that budgetary process? All certain challenges that need to be faced out there. On a technology curve, there's certainly new things that are out there that you have to decide, do I really need this? Uh, it could be, do I need that 3D printer? What is that 3D printer doing for me? How do I get it to work? Um, how would I do something large with a 3D printer? Um, or again, laser scanning. Um, just by show of hands, how many folks out there actually have laser scanners where, where they're at? So, so not many yet, wow, interesting. And of course, training's a big one. How do you train on certain things? How do you budget for that training? How much time is needed? Uh, again, when you're on the early part of that curve as an innovator or adopter, training is scarce to find, that's for sure. And the big one is, where do I go for information? I do want to do 3D GIS applications. Where do I go for those guidelines as far as how do I set things up? Um, right now, there's a whole lot of school of hard knocks that most of us go through on these early phases. Other challenges I mentioned, where do you get data? And here's an, an example of a couple of data sources out there. This is both a, a benefit and it's also a challenge. Um, as Kevin and I mentioned uh, yesterday, how do I start building a digital city or a digital tr uh, roadway corridor? Um, there's sources out there that already have data that you can use and exploit. And I have two uh, websites, one's for Pennsylvania, one's for New York, where they have uh, terrain data available to you. They have aerial imagery available, and in most cases, free as well um, for you to use. Uh, a challenge of both of those sites is how, what's the fidelity of that data that you're receiving? What's the resolution of the terrain or the aerial images? So sometimes free is really good, but maybe it's not enough because it's, the fidelity is not good. Um, the other one I brought up again yesterday is a Google Warehouse, a great place to go get buildings or to see things. But the Google Warehouse has been retired, as you see. Oh, maybe you can't read that real well, but um, what's the integrity of those models? Who made them? How good are they? Are they accurate? Um, certainly 
issues you need to address. Uh, it's a challenge, that's for sure. Um, some projects you might not need all that great detail or accuracy, so these type of sources are excellent to use. Uh, Kevin will actually, when he talks, will show you some more of these sources that you can uh, uh, acquire from. With all this happening, other challenges out there, again, speaking from my side, is we're challenged with dealing with design-build projects versus design-bid-build, and that process alone is, is a challenge for us to deal with on top of trying to do things in 3D and also link data together. Um, definitely daunting to think of. Uh, in the transportation world, the FHWA is, is really promoting SIM technology or civil integrated management versus BIM for building information modeling. I think they chose SIM because they didn't like the word building, um, but they're essentially both trying to achieve uh, the same thing, which is a, a life cycle approach to all of this information. Um, and again, here's some, um, a little more detail on what the SIM is trying to achieve. And the URL on the bottom right hand corner is what you really want. That's the everyday counts. If you just type that in Google, it'll bring you right to the site, but it will detail their goals with SIM. And again, it also references a lot of other innovative technologies, uh, such as laser scanning there as well. So we had mentioned yesterday, and I'm just throwing these out again, that these are all types of things today that uh, we're seeing out there, how to manage that information, what kind of information is it. Uh, uh, we just sat in a, a real nice demo on mobile applications and all the incredible mobile apps out there today for traffic monitoring and everything. Um, how do I get that information to work for my project um, was certainly a co the question asked frequently in that session. And that would hold true for us. I would like to exploit the information from Waze or some of the other, uh, Google, for example, for traffic. How do I get that data to work for me? Where do I start? Um, that's always the biggest one. How much is it? Um, I guess I'd turn it around to challenge everyone here. If you're a structural engineer, how much is it to build a bridge? Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to ask me what type of bridge and, and probe deeper to find out how much that bridge will really cost. And the same holds true for this technology. How much is it to create a 3D GIS of a seven-mile roadway? Well, I need to ask more questions, and so would you, to get more information. And some of those questions would be what's the level of detail of the modeling? What sources are available to me? Um, all those things will help determine what those costs are. Um, what the approach I'm going to show you and I've taken at Bergman, which is slightly different than what Kevin's approach is, uh, we have migrated to GIS applications to kind of be the hub or repository of all this data. And the primary reason why is most of my clients already have the GIS software. And it's important for me not to have to promote new software to those clients, but rethink and repurpose what they already have. So thus the reason why I've gravitated toward uh, GIS applications. And again, some of the challenges coming from that is how do I integrate all that information, which we'll explain and show to you in a few minutes as well. But essentially, we're just trying to leverage information that's out there. And if you really dig hard, there's a lot of excellent information that you can use uh, on a project. Um, and, and likewise, I, I've seen it used to hurt as well, meaning that they don't know they have data available to them. Uh, I did a project for a university, and we needed some pretty accurate terrain to do the campus. And we had to get the campus surveyed. And after we surveyed it and we started working on it, there was a, another group within the university that already had that survey data. And again, if I had known about that, we could have saved a lot of money and time. So again, leveraging this stuff is, is certainly a challenge. And again, I kind of just talked about it, how to get data to work between departments. Uh, 
If you've ever dealt with municipalities, sometimes those departments can be little kingdoms and they don't want to share data between uh, those departments. So how do you get them to change <laughs> the way they work is, is certainly a challenge, but they have excellent data between them and it's just getting over that initial hurdle of trying to get them to communicate uh, between themselves. So instead of just talking, uh, we really want to open up. We're going to show you examples, how they're created, the issues that we have with them. Uh, but we really want questions. I uh, want to make this interactive as possible. Um, it was invigorating yesterday to hear all your questions, so don't be shy um, asking your questions. And so before I jump into things, are there questions I can answer or anything? Oh, yes. You mentioned uh, laser scanning and 3D printers. And I'm just wondering, is there a, 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 a 3D printer application for what we're, we've been talking about this week? This I, I know USC has, is developing a 3D printer to build houses. So they're thinking on a grander scale. Um, and I've seen demos for it. It's pretty interesting what they're doing. So. Again, where 3D printing goes, um, I'm not certain at this, this juncture, uh, to be we, honest We've with actually you. used um, the Z Corp printer quite a bit. It's a starch-based printer that also has a, an inkjet run, and it'll print an image on top of the 3D print. So from a kind of regional geospatial type model, um, that seems to be a good solution. I didn't load pictures for that, but um, it's pretty easy to set up a model to print to that printer. You know, and then there's a lot of printers that do 3D objects, building-like objects or like a roadway section. I know a lot of people are using printers for that sort of thing. There's a little front end work in making the model printable. It has to be closed geometry, whereas in our industry, usually you're trying to minimize geometry, so you're working at the opposite end of the spectrum. But there are, there are a lot of tools there for printing, if that is the question. Anybody out there using 3D printing or experience a 3D printer? And how'd it go? We have a few projects where we're using 3D printers. Majority of the, I mean, it's actually very easy technology. I mean, pretty much MicroStation, AutoCAD, Revit, uh, SketchUp, 3D Studio Max, anything you do, you basically just like, Kevin was saying you, uh, well, you have to work with your model a little bit differently, but it doesn't take that much. And there are products out there where you can basically create one. Uh, well, to export the STL file anyway, you don't have to put much work. All I'm saying is pretty much automated process to uh, go from any application. And the results are quite amazing. If anyone's interested, I actually have a couple of uh, samples we printed here. The actual printed model, it could be bridges, it could be uh, structural details, it could be airports, there are lots of different applications, but the simplicity here, it doesn't take that much, and it's very universal. So it's and once easy. you have a 3D model, obviously. Right. <laughs> but there is nothing new to that if you think about it, I mean, the models were out there forever, so it just... Technology evolves, so we can do it very, very quick these days. We use the 3D model educationally. The three student teams had to collaborate on a building to class section, and we printed it to scale, and if it didn't fit together, they failed the class. <laughs> well, it <laughs> <laughs> really didn't work. <laughs> but I haven't seen like, an application where you can put So you didn't finish? Oh, sorry. <laughs> print, uh, like print boxes or uh, electrical boxes. Nice. If you don't mind me asking, why, why did you 3D print? What were you trying to do? Did you? Do it. It's just another, it's another soft product, or just like why you're doing renderings, same thing. I mean, you have 3D data, you know, so it's very simple to set up a camera and okay. render something out of what you already, you know, put all your work in. So just utilizing 3D data, well, just another way of doing it. You know, it's, it's as easy as setting up a camera and your outcome output is rendering or animation, same thing. If it helps you to warn the project, you know, so. Well, another good example is that, you know, when you see stuff on 3D, you know, on the screen, it's still, you know, it's still a movie is what it is. Um, but 
but then to take a physical model of what you've actually done, I think is something that uh, gives it uh, an even better uh, uh, presentation tool to the, to the client. A good yeah. example is like uh, we, we've done the Golden Gate Bridge uh, seismic retrofit, and we had to uh, model the, the inside of the pier because of all the openings and stuff that they had that you know, they could do a 3D image of it, but then show it physically to say, here's where some of the conflicts are, uh, even though it's at a smaller scale. It's yeah, we used to call it the omnipotent view. Somehow having that uh, godlike view over an object at, with a group of people, it, it's more informative. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, at, at Wistop, for the last several projects, even though they've had the resources to do, you know, um, the 3D modeling, uh, just as a computer visualization, they still, it's worthwhile enough for them to spend 100 grand physical model because they, you know, as, as the project manager said, um, the table where that model is at the state fair, everybody's flocking in there even though there's a screen, the spinning, you know, animation going. So there's, you know, the department sees a lot of value in how much the public is interested in that you know, physical model. Yeah, I can't think of a big project where they didn't at some point print, a, or not print, so usually they were handmade, but use a physical model in some way for the public outreach. And just my experience with the, um, getting it printed to a 3D printer, um, I, I actually, uh, there was a local vendor that I tried to, that was going to offer a sample printing, so we're going to take advantage of it, but to your point, Kevin, um, the way that the, uh, the structure was modeled by the designer, they actually had the design firm uh, had modeled it in Revit, but due to just you know, the level of detail and how it was modeled, it would have taken a significant amount of, of cleanup to make that STL file 3D ready. So that actually makes it from happening because it would have taken, I think, somewhere like 40 hours. Um, that Good print. Yeah. yeah. And there's minimum things, not to go into this modeling so much, but we use a vendor near us to do it, and he does a combination of techniques. So he'll print all the big elements of the model, but then use, you know, string for the cables, you know, traditional modeling methods for the things that are easier to do in a traditional way. So I think, if anything, maybe that's a, a way to, to approach it, is to look for a good vendor that knows a variety of techniques to both, you know, cap your model, print it, and then make it presentable. Anyway. Yeah. Well, related to that, I was wondering if anybody has used stereo viewing since mentioned that 3D is still kind of flat screen, but if you use stereo technology, it's not a longer really flat view. Yeah, we actually have two, we call them caves, they're not really caves, but two of our offices, I think uh, some other firms have done this too, but we have rear projection with a couple of different ways of projecting stereo. You know, now you can buy a projector from companies like Lightspeed and some other ones that do passive projection with one projector. So the only challenge from a visualization side is how do you create content for it. You know, there are some automated tools, but if you just create two cameras and render two sets of renderings side by side with the proper geometry, it's pretty easy to do. Our challenge with it is that uh, sometimes clients just feel uncomfortable putting the glasses on and it feels a bit gimmicky. But I think it is a much richer experience, especially with preliminary models where you don't have a lot of detail that, that gives you a sense of space and scale, you see it more. So it is a more realistic way of uh, presenting, I think, three uh, virtual three-dimensional spaces. We've all seen movies, right? There is a certain experience there that's different than 2D projection. Yeah, I'm on the other side. Most of my projects are small, and it'd be a luxury to have that. And most of my clients are they don't want to put anything on. They're very non-trusting, so <laughs> they'd rather see it. Um, a, a challenge that we're talking about right now is we're all migrating into a 3D world using 2D tools, meaning the surfaces that we create are 2D, the output is 2D. Uh, I think part of the evolution has to be we need to see it in 3D as well. And I. I I'm pessimistic. A physical printed model is nice. If, it, if you ever watch Zoolander, you know, it's like where the tiny people go in that printed model. Well, you got to be tiny to really understand it. And the second it's printed, it's outdated. 
uh, in a immersed interactive 3D model, it, it, you, you keep changing it. It's not as a tedious process to get the output, at least at today. Maybe that will continue to improve uh, over time as well. Good topic. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? Yeah. I think kind of uh, augmented reality with tablets is really just a fantastic compromise. You don't have the motion sickness and you can kind of just, it's like a little window on the world. You can, you, can, you can look at things at any scale and you can have different people looking at the same thing and pretend it's there. It's a, I Do think it's going to be the perfect. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these tools now, like uh, InfoWorks and some of the other 3D modeling engines now support um, they call it augmented reality. I don't know if it's a bit of a stretch for the term, but they're geolocated, so you can hold up their model in your device, and it aligns the view of the model to the place you're at. So if you're in a city model, it knows where you are, and you're seeing the model. So, for instance, if there was a proposed building, you'd be seeing that in its correct location in the view. Yeah, there's some really exciting tools happening. I, I would like to see it head there, something mobile. You're out there and you can experience it. Um, yeah, the, the construction site opportunities there are made, you know, wonderful to think about. Here's how you're going to install this rebar cage today and see right. it in, in the site. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of the vendors are definitely going in that direction. All right. Well, I'll show a couple more demos and hopefully that'll spur on. And, and again, I'm going to be kind of more pessimistic here. I'm going to talk about building these things, but the the challenges as well. It's not all, you know, sunshine and buttercups when you build these things. There's a lot of effort that goes into it. Um, a lot of this technology is still new, so there's a lot of bugs that need to be worked out. And uh, let's just talk about this particular model here, which is the downtown area of Rochester, New York. Uh, and I'm using a city engine to navigate through this particular one. Um, on the good side, City Engine's a web-based application, so right now I'm pinging Esri servers where this is being hosted, so I have a lot of uh, potential for people to see this model and interact with this model, so you're reaching a wider audience easier. Uh, on the negative side, I'm going through the Esri servers, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm losing some control uh, of these models. Um, I'm also running over the internet and speed is the killer out there and it depends on the bandwidth that you have to access this information. This is a 150 megabyte file and we all know how long it takes to download 150 megabytes and in the internet if you're taking more than a second and a half, the attention span of the average person, they, who's going to wait long for that? Um, so I certainly need to see the bandwidth pick up on here. And, and the other thing I don't like, as I'm being negative, is that I'm only showing you a portion of the project. I can't show you the whole thing because I can't run it in City Engine. It'll crash. Um, and again, hopefully Esri will improve performance over time. Um, it's one reason why, as I mentioned yesterday, I have to use Unity as well, which is a gaming engine. Uh, Unity will crush this in any size model um, running and, and I'll have to uh, revert to uh, a Unity model. So uh, I'll rehash how these models are created. Again, starting, it's kind of like uh, building a cake or cooking a dinner. You got to start with the base and the base here is a terrain model. And as Kevin alluded to, and I have, there's many different ways of getting that source information, whether it's survey data, or LIDAR information, or whatever USGS source you might have. Um, everybody gets all excited over LIDAR and how great it is and how easy it is to use, but LIDAR is also uh, not as accurate as you'd like it to be. It, it interpolates a lot. Uh, for example, hopefully I can... Another thing I don't like about City Engine, it's hard to drive. I'm not a good driver in City Engine, so bear with me for a second. The um, roadway corridor you see here is a submerged uh, corridor. And when LIDAR 
pings down to earth. It doesn't know what to do with a brake line, so it interpolates, so you end up getting a blob. So anything that has a brake line, you have to go back in by hand and fix somehow, either by survey data or just eyeballing it. And so a lot of work for the city, we had to go back and clean up the, the river walls, the, uh, again, the inner loop highways you see here. Um, but we have our base, and it's geo-referenced and spatial uh, using uh, state plane coordinates for this particular model, uh, if you're wondering. Um, once we build a terrain model, we will overlay aerial imagery, and you can get aerial imagery from a variety of sources. In New York State, they have the GIS Clearinghouse, which has a massive amount of aerial imagery which you can acquire, and most of it's free. That's the good news. On the bad side is the resolution is not that great, so it's, it's granular. Um, and if you're in a, a rural area where you don't have a lot of detail, that might be just fine. But if you get into a city where you need to get down low and see things, uh, the lower the resolution, the more grainy and blurry or pixelated your image is going to look like. Um, other vendors such as Pictometry are out there, and they'll certainly sell you the imagery if, if you want to go that route. Um, lots of different vendors, Air Photo USA, um, et cetera, are out there. So build the terrain model, drape the aerial imagery on top of that, and the next thing we'll do is build the existing environment. And the way we do it for now, at least, is we'll outsource that to a vendor. Um, the two I like to use are CyberCity 3D, which is based here in California, and then PLW Model Works, which is a firm in Florida. Both can take um, oblique imagery and calculate building heights and, and generate some pretty accurate models off of those aerials. Um, and then they can provide them to you as massings with no colors, or if you prefer, they'll texture them based off the aerials as well. And PLW did all of the buildings in Rochester, and let me see if I zoom in. From a perspective, they look pretty darn good, but as you see as I zoom in, or hopefully zoom in, they blur out. And they blur out because that is the resolution of the aerial imagery. Um, my experience so far is even if you have access to four inch aerial imagery, it still blurs out. And uh, that's just something you need to deal with. Um, the fixes, if you really want nice clean images, then you're gonna have to take at grade photography and apply those images uh, to those models, um, which you can do. It's just a time consuming process. And let me see if I can find one in here where we have, whoops, excuse me again, I hate navigating in this one, so bear with me as I, as I make you all ill probably. So this building right here, as you can see, we, we used that great photography, so as we get in close, it still looks crisp. And that's the way you should think about as you build these environments. Focus where you need to focus and spend your money where you have to. Let the other areas either be, and I'll show you other examples where massings are just fine uh, for, for those projects. Um, Charles, yes. Ask a so sure. So you built a, looks like a really nice model in Rochester. Mm -hmm. Is that owned by the city of Rochester now? I mean, if I want to do a project in Rochester and I want to build a bridge on the other side of the city, can I start from your model? Or? Yes. Um, the city, we own the models, but the city owns them as well. We can do what we want with them, and they can. Um, the city's plan is to expand the city primarily on the backs of developers. As they come in to develop, they're going to require the developer to give them the 3D model of their project to be put into their 3D model. Uh, and they've done so at a couple smaller sites to, to start. And you're building your cake, I guess. Um, and that, that's a good segue into, okay, we've put in existing things, and, and it can be buildings, trees, light poles, whatever you want to add in, uh, you can, uh, vehicles. Or maybe you have SketchUp models that you want to add to it. Or in the case right here, this is a Revit model. Hopefully I don't make you ill, and I'll try to drive in and 
look at this Revit model. Oh, I'm behind a building, so let me go forward a little bit. This is a full Revit model of a transit, a proposed transit center in, in Rochester um, that they uh, used for several reasons. One was to assess did they like that design. Um, but after the constructor won, they did a lot of uh, uh, construction sequencing and space planning. Can they get construction cranes in this tight space and so forth? Um, but primarily showing that you can bring in any type of model into your world. And that's the exciting thing for me is you're building a world that's not proprietary. It's, it's your world and you should be have the ability to add in data, whatever that data might happen to be. So once you start building it, you should be able to do things with it. And right now, uh, City Engine allows you to layer and add things, as you see on the layer side. And I'm just going to turn a couple on for an example. And right now, I've turned on the city's master plan, where it's a 2D image overlaid on top of the 3D model to give you an idea of where they want to expand things. Um, City Engine comes in with some built-in code, such as this multi-viewer here, which hopefully will activate. There we go. Where I can use a slider to see, wow, it's really struggling, so. See existing and proposed conditions. Uh, it's lagging way behind me. But, uh, Typically what we do is we layer however it needs to be layered. If there's a site that has three different designs on it, we'll create three different layers and then toggle between each of those layers. Um, this allows us not to have to toggle. We can just slide. Um, and they have other ways of doing that top-down, side view, there's a whole bunch. Um, any other questions before I? Um, so, go ahead. So you said that you, with City View here, you could only load in this portion of Rochester. I mean, not to name names of companies, but I mean, certain companies had struggles of scalability. I mean, what's the sort of scale that these, that City View in particular works or, or some of these others will work at? Well, I, uh, that's a tough one to answer um, because. Uh, I can do a, a lot larger area, just not as much detail. I have 570 buildings. A lot of them are in very high detail with lots of geometry. If I had less geometry on those structures, I'd probably be able to put in a large, larger area. So, and that's something you'll have to deal with. And again, it's the challenge. How much information are you trying to show in real time uh, to do so? Um, there's many things to consider, and I guess I'll start with the basics. We have a, a 3D modeling guide that I give to my clients, and what it is, it describes the different levels of detail that a model can be, all the way from amassing up to a Revit model, and there's cost associated with that level of detail, not only price-wise, but performance-wise. Um, or if you want everything, the whole enchilada, high detail, and you still want a massive area, then I have to spend a lot of time optimizing the, the model. And an example of optimizing would be I'm going to create three separate levels of detail for one building. So when I'm in close, the polygonal count and texture resolution is very high. And as I pull away, the geometry drops and the texture resolution drops so that I can keep moving in real time. Um, it's a very doable process, it's just time consuming to do. It's very much like what your eye sees. If you look at a chain link fence from a couple hundred yards, you see the posts and rails, you do not see the chains. And as you get closer and closer to that fence, you finally do see the chain link and the same holds true in this world. If I'm up high right now, why should I have the full geometry to that trans transit center on? I shouldn't, I should turn things off. Um, other things you'll learn rapidly as you go, if you're gonna texture a face or a geometry, make sure it's the face that you see. It, you don't need to texture the other side if you're never gonna see it. If you do, the computer's gonna try to calculate 
that texture as it, it's, as it does math. So little things like that you learn as, as you go um, to do these things. A any other questions? Yeah. Does City Engine recognize those multiple levels of detail? Like Wood? Not now. No, not right now. That's something that I certainly want. That's why I have to squish down uh, the size. Um, what we have had happen is, again, on the good side, I have vendors that I can use to create that, let's say, a square kilometer area. But then that vendor sometimes is not as good as he could be modeling everything. He creates extra surfaces or maybe is very sloppy with his textures. And to me, that really impacts the performance of City Engine or even Unity with because the computer is trying to calculate so many things it really doesn't need to. And, and, and I'll give you an example, and, and Kevin had mentioned yesterday is texture baking, where you bake a texture to a surface. It's one texture that the computer has to calculate for that surface. Um, which some of the models we were getting back on a citywide basis, they had a thousand textures in each model. And the computer is just going crazy trying to, you know, a computer's dumb, it only does what you tell it to do. And so it's like, well, there's a thousand textures, I better calculate that. So. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, it's a whole lot of math going on. And the less math, the better the performance. So what is the ease of bouncing between the systems? Because you're saying as you max out here, you may have to jump over to Unity. Is it a fairly simple transition from one to the other or back, or is it difficult? Um, the process we follow is we try to do everything in one master 3D model that goes into the GIS database. And when needed, we take a GIS snapshot in time and export it or publish it into uh, City Engine, for example, or we'll export it and publish it into Unity. Um, there's a little bit of effort to do that, but it's not that bad, no. And, and to me, I feel lucky that I have two solutions that I can still give. Uh, the City of Rochester has two deliverables, a City Engine one and a Unity uh, uh, deliverable. Uh, they're different, um, and, and that's where, again, some of the challenges you'll run into. Again, we're, we're dealing, if anybody's dealt with Esri, you have multi-patch and all sorts of wackiness that they've been using for years. Um, the gaming environment is a much different process, and so those are things. I know Esri is trying to rewrite City Engine to accommodate that, but um, my pessimistic self says maybe that's two years away, so I don't know on that one. But again, a challenge. I'm not going to sit here and say it's the easiest thing to do. You click a button. It's not. There's still a lot of effort that needs to go in. Um, but the bottom line is this is where everything's heading. Again, I'm on the early end of that curve. And I'm going to suffer through a lot. And I'm going to fall at times. When do you want to join? But you're going to have to join um, Esri and Autodesk and, and other vendors are all heading to 3D environments. InfraWorks is a 3D environment. City Engine is a 3D environment. Not just a building, but a, a macroscopic thing. We're coming up on an hour. Okay, do you want to jump in or? Not here. Okay, I'm getting the hook over here. Um, the last thing I'll show in this model is uh, what I am very excited about City Engine, I think will happen in InfraWorks and probably in Revit and in Bentley's products as well as uh, procedural rules being created. Uh, a rule allows you to automate a process. And for example, what I've done is I've turned on the master plan buildings. Um, I'll turn them off for a second so you can see them hopefully. Or maybe not. Wake up. Well, we'll, we'll leave them on for a minute. Anyway, I had that 2D plan. and. The city wants to see that in 3D. They have this 3D model now, so they don't want to see the overlay. So what we did is we took um, city engines and created rules. And those rules were based on the zoning and permitting of the city for each zone of the city. There's a tower district, et cetera. And what the rules tell me is what can the building height be? What can be the setbacks? What are the textures that are allowed to be used in that zone? Uh, the window area coverage, uh, and a litany of other rules. And they all get applied into City Engine. And when it gets time to create the 3D buildings, I identify the building footprints 
and then tell the rules to model the buildings. So all of these buildings that you see, the new ones, hopefully I zoom in on them, were generated by the computer, not by anyone. And I think over time, these models will become even more detailed. And, and again, if we had more rules, they'd be more detailed. But an hour processing time generated, you know, a couple hundred buildings to that kind of level. And again, uh, on the good side, I'm all excited. This looks pretty nice. Uh, on the re realistic side, the city comes back and goes, wow, well, those are too realistic. Now people are going to think that's the building to be built. I need you to make them look simpler. So, <laughs> so we had to go back, and the, the, the current version, which will be published next week, they'll be semi-transparent, uh, sort of cloudy-looking buildings instead of detailed buildings. So all that effort. But I think over time, that's how you're going to model yourself. You're going to have a set of rules already given to you as a base, and you're going to modify those rules. I, I think someday somebody's going to go, man, remember when they used to have to model by hand on the computer? Um, those were crazy days. So I'm going to pass it over to Kevin, and he has a whole bunch to show. And